On behalf of the Engineering Science Department and the uh, School of Science and Technology, I would like to welcome you all to this, uh, in fact, fifth uh, uh, lecture in the uh, in the series uh, this uh, this semester, uh, this academic year. Also, uh, I would like to uh, thank Agilent Technologies for their support uh, uh, of this uh, for this uh, engineering. Uh, uh, lecture uh, series since the start in 2006. Uh, uh, before I uh, introduce our guest speaker for today, let me mention that uh, for uh, two weeks from now, on November the 17th, uh, we have a speaker from uh, 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 Medtronics and by the name of Dr. Joseph uh, Bergland. Uh, he is the R&D uh, uh, product development manager and uh, he'll be talking uh, on uh, bioengineering uh, in uh, uh, cardio, car, uh, cardiovascular uh, pro, uh, uh, research. And then um, uh, in your, in your uh, uh, flyer that uh, I think you have, you received by email, uh, in fact, there was another speaker from Broadcom uh, who I uh, invited to come and then uh, talk about the uh, efficient uh, in uh, energy, energy efficient network networks, but then uh, just a few days ago he uh, said that he could not come. So I quickly went to to Joseph, and uh, uh, I'm glad that he uh, accepted the invitation. But he has not to tell you the truth. He has not even given me the the the, the total uh, title. So that's I think the area that he's going to be talking. Uh, the uh, our guest speaker for today is Dr. Uh, uh, Muli who is an associate uh, professor at uh, Buck Institute, and the title of his talk, as you see, is The Aging uh, Research and uh, Care in the Era of Personalized uh, Genetics and uh, uh, Genomics. Dr. Uh, Sean Mooney is an associate professor and director of uh, bioinformatics at, Buck, at the Buck Institute for Research on Aging, and uh, is an adjunct Associate Professor of Medical and Molecular uh, Genetics at Indiana University School of Medicine. Dr. Mooney received his PhD in uh, Pharmaceutical Chemistry from UC San Francisco in 2001. At Stanford University, he was uh, an American Cancer Society uh, John Peter uh, Hoffman Fellow in the Department of uh, Genetics and uh, Medical Informatics until 2003. He joined the Buck Institute in 2009 and is primarily funded uh, from uh, NIH, that's the National Institute of uh, Health Grants. He is also the assessing, uh, the assessing group for the uh, critical assessment of functional <coughs> annotation. He is co-founder of two uh, communities focused on uh, entrepreneurship in uh, biomedicine and technology. And uh, in the uh, in the Indiana Biomedical Entrepreneur Network, he, he recently founded a company that uh, received a grant from uh, the National Institute of Health to develop scientific uh, collaboration software. So here he is Sean. Great, thank you very much. Okay, so I, I when I initially set my abstract, I focused mostly, I think, on aging research. In, um, within that. And I think, actually, given probably the, the group here, I thought maybe it might be more interesting to talk about, um, I'll, I'll incorporate some aging, but not a lot. I'm going to talk mostly about um, genomes and human genomes and why we think they're interesting. And two, I will talk about the computer infrastructure that enables biomedical research um, in both the U.S. and around the world. And uh, We'll focus more on genomes than the other side. It depends on how much time I have. All right. So as you probably all know, in 2001, the human genome was sequenced. Um, this was a, a multi-decade uh, project. Um, and uh, it took the effort of literally hundreds, perhaps thousands of scientists. It got a big splash when it came out. The original genome that was funded under the public project was in fact um, was in fact a handful, a small handful of people. I think it was five people 
Um, I'm not exactly sure. And they came up with essentially an initial draft of what this long sequence would look like. Um, and this basically gave us a platform, us being biomedical researchers or bioinformaticians, to actually annotate the genome or to put what we know about biochemistry and biology in humans back onto the genome um, and gave rise to essentially a new era of research. And this is essentially what I'm going to tell you about today. So just for those of you that don't have a biology background, the human genome, um, the human genome uh, is separated amongst uh, 23 uh, chromosomes or 23 pairs of chromosomes. Um, and essentially, it can be represented as this four base, this four letter alphabet sequence that is three billion letters long. And essentially, the function of the genome, that is genes, um, are encoded within that sequence. The coding region actually turns out to be rather small. About 3% of that total 3 billion long base pair sequence is actually producing uh, pro the products of what we call genes. Um, oh yeah, so I say it here. Uh, actually, about 1.5% are actually exons. I'm not going to go into too much detail about the structure of the genome. Um, initially, it was thought that there would be a, approximately 100,000 genes in the human genome. That number is much smaller now, probably on the order of 25,000, uh, somewhere between 20 and 25,000. Um, there are 38,000 entries in the gene database, and the reason is that some of those are duplicates because they're genes that provide different roles and are considered to be uh, unique, essentially unique genes. Um, human gene structure on the genome um, is essentially consists of a regulatory region that is outside of it, and then you have exons and introns and exons. Um, the exons are what are then each often translated into proteins. Um, this is essentially the central dogma of, of biology. And then proteins essentially do the molecular work of the cell. All right. Um, now, so let's forward, fast forward 10 years. Where are we in terms of the human genome? Well, now we can sequence genomes um, at a mu at much much lower cost at much higher throughput. In fact, sequencing a whole human genome within the context of pretty much a regular clinical study within a medical center is now possible. So if someone registers for some genetic study, the clinician or the, the genetic researcher can actually propose to sequence their genome and do association to the whatever the, uh, whatever the clinical phenotype, whatever the clinical work is, uh, is proposing to do. In 2010, a single genome was analyzed and annotated um, at Stanford University. It was published in Lancet. Um, the lead author on this was, uh, was um, Russ Altman. He was my former mentor. He's chair of bioengineering at Stanford. Um, and he was working in collaboration with the Quake Lab. Stephen Quake develops technology for um, next generation sequencing and a tool Buttes group, which does bioinformatics of um, which does bioinformatics of, uh, uh, of human disease and genetics. Um, it's probably no, I think I'm allowed to say this, it's no secret that the, the genome that they annotated was in fact Stephen Quake's um, genome. When they did this, they essentially took all the information we know about genetics and mapped it to that genome and asked the question, well, what, what does it look like Stephen Quake has risks for? What variants? that genetic variants that have been previously associated with human disease and human risk factors for disease, which ones does he have? And they found a number of them. So for example, I'll talk a little bit more about pharmacogenetics in a bit, but these are genetic, basically, sites across the genome that are polymorphic in the population. That means they're distributed, you know, they can be, you know, often of different flavors and different people. And some of these sites give rise to differences in how people respond to certain drugs or certain treatments in the clinic. So we call these pharmacogenetic, drug genetic interactions, um, and we have a, uh, uh, and that we, they found when they anna did annotations, a number of associations with known drugs. For example, VKORC1 is associated with warfarin response, um, and the cytochromes are associated with the metabolism of a large number of drug molecules. Um, today, there is a consortium from around the world 
called the Thousand Genomes Consortium that is actually sequencing entire genomes of many people. They published their initial data, um, I think a year ago in Nature. That initial data set, yeah, in fact, this, this guy right here, um, a year ago in Nature, and they, I think, sequenced about 180 genomes completely. Their goal is to sequence, initially it was 1,000. Prices have come down on genome sequencing so much that I think they're now doing 2,500, and they expect to have that data released. There's a huge data problem, and I'll talk about this a little bit more later if I have time. Um, those, the raw data from those 180 genomes, from the 1,000 Genomes Project, is put online. You can download it right now. You can just go to the website, and, and they'll give you the, the raw data. It's seven point something terabytes in size. That's 180. Now they're going to do 2,500. You can do the math. This is a huge data issue. Um, genomes and next genera what we call next generation sequencing, I'll also talk about that, produces data unlike anything I think we've ever seen in, bio in biology. A single instrument, um, a single instrument can produce in a single experiment more than 200 million short sequences of 100 bases each, just to yeah. give you an idea. Bill, I can ask you a question. Mm -hmm. Is it that the uh, genome now uh, will uh, have, have, have some effect on the aging now? From the time to time? I will talk a little bit about aging. Um, I think uh, there is efforts underway to understand the genetics of age, so that we can separate this into two groups. First, there's essentially the molecular causes of human aging. It's a very important um, and a very um, timely area of genetic study. The other side of that is understanding the genetics of aging associated diseases, cancer, heart disease, neurodegenerative diseases, things like that. And um, on the, the la in the former case, for the understanding aging, there are efforts underway, and I'm going to talk about this brief, very briefly now. Um, about uh, it to identify essentially a genetic fingerprint of longevity. Like let's say we took a pool of a number of people, say a thousand people who are all centenarians, who live to a hundred, and we're relatively healthy. Are there genetic determinants in their, in their genes that are somehow statistically different than if you looked at the whole general population that doesn't live that long, that healthy? Obviously there are environmental components as well. Um, but again, just looking at the genetics. So we're looking for genetic fingerprints. As of today, there are no. All right, so this is the age of genome sequencing in the clinic is absolutely here. So what's the billion dollar question? Well, the billion dollar question is, well, how do differences, that is, if we were to sequence my genome and map it to the genome that we sequenced 10 years ago, we would identify sites that were different in my genome than the genome that's published. And the big, and there'll be millions of them, literally millions of these sites. And so the big challenge is to identify which sites give rise to things that make me me and which things are essentially have no, which genetic variants essentially have no effect. That's the big goal. Um, many of you have probably heard of Moore's Law. It essentially says that computers, the number of, I think the number of transistors on a chip is growing over time at a particular rate. I believe it is exponential. Um, Next-gen sequencing, in terms of the cost and the amount of data that it's producing, has surpassed, and I believe far surpassed Mar Moore's law right now. Um, the amount of data that's being produced is, is really pretty incredible. Um, and that's largely because the costs have gone down so much in such a short period of time. Um, this is a, 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 a figure, oh, actually, we should be able to see this. This is a figure from Eric Lander. Um, uh, and the original genome uh, cost $300 million in 2001. Um, now a genome can be sequenced for around 20K, and I expect uh, maybe as low as 10K, and I expect a $1,000 genome to happen relatively soon. So annotation is key. You have a genome sequence. How do you process the seven terabytes of data if you're working with 180 of them? Um, well, we're really good at, at 
building databases of basically genetic elements that seem to be associated with specific diseases or specific responses to drugs or something like that. Um, we've created databases within biomedicine. For example, you can go to farmgkb.org. This is uh, hosted at Stanford University, also in Russ's lab and run by Terry Klein, my PhD mentor. Um, the Human Mut Gene Mutation Database in Cardiff, Wales have large amounts of va variants from, uh, from clinical studies. Uh, many of them are rare disease variants. That is, if you have the variant, you probably have the disease. Um, or at least if you have two copies of the variant, you often have the disease. And um, we now essentially know lots of these things that, that are associated with disease. So this has given rise to something I've implied a second ago, and what I, what I call essentially genome databases. These are databases where we annotate basically pieces of information upon this, se this 3 billion base pair sequence that we uh, identified an initial draft of 10 years ago, and of course this draft has been, modified, has been modified ever since. So the draft today probably looks quite a bit different than the draft that was initially published. Um, there are two major uh, genome databases that people use, the UC Santa Cruz uh, Genome Annotation Database and David Hausler's group, and the Ensemble Genome Annotation Database in Europe. The, the, um, there's also the National Center for Biomedical Biotechnology Information, NCBI, at the NIH, um, that is another, uh, another uh, primary database source of genetic and annotation-like information. These databases are growing incredibly. The, U the UCSC genome database, I believe, has more than 2,000 tables in it now. It might be quite a bit higher than that. Every table is a piece of information you might want to understand across the genome. So what we're looking at here is a visualization of the genome. Anybody can do this. If you go to genome.ucsc.edu, again, this is software that was developed out of um, David, ha and, and the annotations were developed out of David Hausler's group. Um, people like Jim Cl Kent were also heavily involved um, in its development. This is the UCSC genome browser. And so what are we looking at here? So imagine for a moment, so you're looking at essentially a table where you've got a number of rows that go down and you have a number of columns. Imagine for a second if we were to take that three billion long base pair sequence and we were to write it along the wall here. And if we were to write it, it would probably go to, I don't know, Europe over there and China over there. I have no idea how long it would be. But if we were to write it on the wall and then take a window that we could magically resize and put that window on the wall where we've got the sequence going across, that's essentially what we're looking at. So this is on chromosome 21. We are looking at position 33,025,000 to about position 33,050,000. So this is 25,000 letters in that four letter long sequence right here. Okay? And then below this, we have rows of data. This is data that we might want to annotate upon the human genome. So when they sequence the human genome, this long sequence, what was the, you know, the, the first thing that they asked themselves? Well, they, they said, well, let's go to all the other sequencing we've done before we knew what the human genome was, and let's map it. Let's try to find the positions that it maps to on the human genome um, from that database. So we had a database of all the known genes, for example, so they could map those genes. We had a, um, a database of all the known transcripts of genes, that is, the products of genes. And so they went and they basically iteratively mapped all of them back to the genome, and what we're looking at here is, as rows, going below this are all the genes that we know about that map to the genome. Again, I'm not going to go into too much uh, detail here. Um, I think uh, um, uh, if you're familiar with this, you're welcome to ask questions. The little hash marks here, notice this is pointing this way and this one's pointing this way. Um, the hash marks represent the direction that the gene encodes from, so the gene is coded this way. Um, into a transcript or this way in the transcript. It can go both ways since our DNA is two anti-parallel uh, strands. Um, and then below this we have other sequences from other databases. Um, so for example, RefSeq is the NCBI transcript database and you can see that uh, where are these transcripts map here. And then below this we have other pieces of information. Like for example, we might want to take a bunch of other organisms whose genome we, we know, like say the chimpanzee. 
It's very similar to humans. We might want to map the chimpanzee genome and actually align it to the human genome so that regions that are the same in the chimp are aligned to the regions that are the same in human. And then we can look at things like how conserved evolutionarily, like how much pressure is there on the sequence not to change? So how similar are those sequences? And we can do that with other genomes as well. And when we do that, we can map, we can get a table that looks like this. So this is rhesus, um, rhesus monkey, mouse, dog, elephant. And notice as we go down, they get more and more different. The bottom is zebra fish, so it's very different. This is a fish. Um, you can see that less and less regions map. But it's interesting to note, I believe, I didn't plan this, but I believe, yeah, if you look at this carefully, the things that go all the way down are the blocks that are in the genes, in this gene here. SOD, I believe, is superoxide dismutase, is a very important gene. So it's very well conserved in other organisms, in other species. It's there. Um, and then finally, we have um, SNPs. I'm going to talk a lot about SNPs, SNPs over the next 35 minutes. These are genetic variants. These are variants, positions in the population that vary between individuals. And then finally, we have repeating element regions. It turns out that in the mouse genome, I don't know what the number is for humans, but in the mouse genome, about 40% of the entire genome is very simple repeats. AT, 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 or four base repeats, where there are four letters and they repeat over and over again. These repeats actually can be polymorphic and can give rise to diseases. Um, but 40% uh, in the mouse, I assume that it's somewhat similar in humans, but I, I don't quote me on Well, you're going to quote me on that, but um, that's okay. I've been wrong before. Um, okay, so l let's, let's think about this in terms of variation. We've sequenced one, you know, a, a handful of people. We've created this one long sequence. And now we're going to start sequencing other people. And we're going to align it to that original sequence. And we're going to start seeing differences. So let's not think like a biologist. Let's think, you know, like maybe a computer scientist. It's a three billion long sequence of A's, T's, G's, and C's. What do you think the differences are we're going to observe? This is a question for you. Somebody can answer. What's the, what do you think is the most common type of difference that we might observe? Anybody? Eye color. Uh, sorry? Eye color. No, like a difference in the sequence. So we write, like say, three billion letters across the wall, and then we sequence your genome, and we write three billion, your three billion letters across the wall, and we look at that sequence of letters compared to your sequence of letters, and we identify differences in those letters. Three million? We see three, we actually, it is, it's pretty close. It's several million. But what are the kinds of changes that we might see? Well, with the, with the four letters, A, T, uh, G, C, and so on, we can have uh, some, some combinations, right? But then the point is that how many times would these combinations... Like right. Well, what I'm getting at is actually what the kinds of differences we might see if we align them. And the, the most common type... Sorry? Uh, I think there'll be some uh, inserted sections. Mm -hmm. uh, there, now we're getting the right track. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So we could see inserts or deleted sections, depending on which direction you're looking at. What else? One letter replaced by another. Right? One, one letter replaced by another, exactly. Any other ideas? What was that? Translocation. Yes, exactly. Sequences of move to different places. Exactly. Perfect. All right. So the most common type is these single nucleotide changes, by far. The next type that's also common is small insertions and deletions. These are one base that's gone, a couple bases that are gone, or are there. There are also large insertion and deletions. There's also something called copy number variants. And to be honest with you, I don't understand copy number variation as well as I should. But essentially what it translates to is that there are large islands of DNA that seem to be, that seem to be repeated in the genome. This is real. We can now say this. Um, that seem to be repeated. They can have genes in them. And the number of repeats in different individuals is polymorphic. That is. Different individuals have different numbers of these islands. Um, and so that's also important for disease. So people associate the number of islands with different diseases or effects. Uh, question, are those typically, uh, uh, does the uh, section change its length? Or uh, is there something else that, uh, something that's dropped out when the repeat the section changes its length. But you can also have large deletions as well. Okay. Um, 
So I, I think, I, basically, I think my message is anything goes, and the most common is these single nucleotide changes, and those are also the ones that have been most studied, I think. Mm -hmm. um, how often? So if we were to take, say, your, your sequence again, and we were to map it, we would see about one out of every thousand positions would have some difference to the draft genome. So in graphical form, if you had this block here, you'd have about one letter for every one of these blocks that changes from the draft. So this means that your number is very close. Each one of us differs by several million nucleotides, several million letters in this sequence. And so the question is, what of these letters give rise to actual things we can observe clinically, and which ones are what we call neutral? That means they have no effect. Um, we now know a lot of these differences. When I gave this talk a year ago, uh, not here, but when I give, gave this, approximately this presentation a year ago, I always cataloged, the, looked at the number of genetic variants that we knew about in, in the human population. We store them in a database that's in Washington, D.C. at the NIH called dbSNP, database SNP. And it stores all genetic variants, not just single nucleotide changes, but that's okay. And a year ago, when I did this, it was around 17 million, or you know, between 15 and 17 million validated. Over the last year, because of the increase in number of genomes that we can sequence, this has increased to 41,744,328 as of yesterday. That means that there are 41 different si million different sites on the genome that are known to vary in different human populations. Again, we want to know which ones of these are what we call functional, which ones are going to give rise to clinical effects or risks of clinical <coughs> effects. How many of those uh, occur on genes? Uh, it's it, it, good, good, very good question. So a much smaller percent actually occurs within gene regions, much smaller. Okay. It's about, as I said before, it's about 1.5 percent for exons, probably about 3 percent for the whole gene. Um, I mean, you can just multiply that. I think it's probably going to be a little less than that amount because of the way evolution works. But um, I would expect that it's going to be much, much smaller. Um, but as you'll see in a second, you don't have to be located in genes to cause disease. The, the Human Gene Mutation Database, which is the primary database of inherited genetic variants that have been actually associated with human disease, um, contains 117,277 <coughs> variants as of yesterday. So if you think about that, um, there's a big difference in numbers. I think the really actual striking thing here, though, this kind of gives you an insight into how big biomedicine actually is now. Every single one of these variants, of these 117,000 variants, has a clinical study behind it. So there's literally tens of thousands of studies that have been done to identify genetic variants that cause disease. Um, PharmGKB is a this other database that contains, it's at Stanford, that contains genetic variants that are associated with pharmacogenetic effects. That is, they're variants that are polymorphic, again, in the population, and people that have one type of variant seem to respond differently to therapies or drugs. And then finally, there's COSMIC, which is, um, contains 186,431 spontaneous mutations. So spontaneous mutations, um, are very interesting, something I actually study in my group. Um, you, you, when you were born, um, your parents gave you a single genome sequence uh, that was present in that fertilized egg that gave rise to the embryo that produced you. Um, as we age, cells divide. As these cells divide and grow and just sit there, occasionally mistakes will occur in the, in the genetic code. So certain cells will actually have a slightly different sequence than the one you inherited. These are mutations that are called spontaneous mutations. They occur all the time, and they cause a wide variety of different diseases. They cause, um, they have caused some component of human aging. They cause cancer, um, and a wide variety of other things. So we now are doing sequences for, from, and this is almost all from, from tumors. Um, we do sequences of cancers and identify the variants that are different from the variants that that individual inherited. Can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. Is it that the variation makes uh, new diseases or the new diseases make the variations? I'm 
because you said that folks sometimes the variations are spontaneous yeah. and not totally random, but I think for this purpose we can think of them as random. They just occur all over the place. They're not random in reality. They, they, there are certain uh, uh, regions of the genome that seem to get more mutations than others. Yeah. But then once these mutations occur, some of them lead to, could lead to the progression of cancer. Enable, you know, basically they knock down a wall that enables the cell to divide um, in the presence of regulation within the body that tells it not to divide. And that's essentially what cancer is. Now, there are two types of uh, diseases that we talk about. One is uh, the one which can come and go, like maybe, like the uh, HIV flu or whatever. But then the other ones, like cancer, which may stay. Are you talking about the one which will stay? I think that's. I'm talking about the ones that have a genetic basis yes. okay. for, I mean, for, in this case, I'm only talking about cancer. Okay. These are only variants that are present in cancer. Yeah. Um, so what does this have to do with aging? Well, there's a group, for example, called the Longevity Consortium um, that is actually trying to identify this fingerprint that I talked about, where imagine we could sequence a bunch of centenarian genomes and a, a number of control genomes, that is, people that aren't centenarians and aren't likely to be or, or weren't, and um, identify a fingerprint that makes someone live a long time. There have been Two, two GWAS studies, uh, sorry, genome-wide studies um, that I'm familiar with, they didn't involve whole genome sequencing, but they looked at uh, markers across the genome, and so you could still imagine developing a fingerprint from this. Um, both of these studies, well, one of the studies failed to identify that fingerprint. Just did not, there just didn't seem to be a signal there with the power that they had. In other words, the number of people that they interrogated. And the second study, um, actually initially claimed to, and then um, a, a reanalysis of the data, it looks like, um, in fact, we now know that, it, that that was, in fact, not, it does not look like there was a fingerprint there, although the authors have suggested that they'll republish, they'll publish the paper with, with updated data. So we, this is still unanswered. Um, let's think about how genetic variants can cause disease. And I'm only going to talk about single nucleotide variants. So the mo ones that have been the most studied and I think they're the most interesting f uh, from my perspective because, uh, because they're the most subtle. If you have an A to a G position change in a, in a human genome, it would give rise to a disease that um, could cause uh, a lethal birth, basically a dead baby. And w we want to know how that single base out of three billion can cause this. Um, let's imagine this as being the genome. This is just a cartoon of what you were looking before in the genome browser. We have exons here, the introns are here, so this is the whole gene. There's an upstream region, a regulatory region. Mm -hmm. Then there's these long stretches between the genes that are intergenic. And this is what, 97% of the whole genome. Well, we could map, you know, if we had these single base changes mapped all the way across here, we could find ones that are in the regulatory region. We might name them, call them regulatory SNPs, regulatory single nucleotide polymorphisms. We could find ones that are in exons that give rise to a change in the protein product of that gene. So genes produce transcripts that then are translated into proteins. Again, this is a central dogma of biology. Proteins are massive macromolecular machines, or can be massive macromolecular machines. And if the amino acid sequence in that protein is different, that might break the machine. Um, there also, if for those of you that remember back to your basic biology, the DNA sequence and then the RNA sequence, when it's translated, the reason we call it translation into a protein is that there are three bases that are called codons, basically these ladder of three bases, three bases, three bases, and each one is a codon. And the codons, and there's, so there's 64 different possibilities that you could have, and each one of these 64 different possibilities maps to some signal or an amino acid. And that amino acid is then strung together like a necklace to form this, again, this, this self-organizing machine that performs the work of the cell. Um, some of these codons, since there are only 20 amino acids in this protein necklace, some of these codons can be changed but still result in the same necklace sequence. There's redundancy in the system. 
And so we separate those because we think that the ones that change the sequence in the necklace are more likely to change, you cause disease than the ones that aren't. And we call them, this is a little bit, a little bit esoteric, but we call them non-synonymous SNPs, NS SNPs. These are the ones that change the necklace sequence. And synonymous SNPs are ones that don't because they encode for a codon, three bases. They encode for the same amino acid or the same part of that necklace. There are also ones that are, can be in the middle called intronic. And what I'm going to argue here to you is that every single one of these has been associated with human disease, sometimes for reasons we don't quite understand. I would say the majority of them are in this region, the non-synonymous. There are a number of them in the synonymous region. And um, there are a number of them in the regulatory region, pushing 1,000 now in the regulatory region. And this gives rise, this is, this is the light switch, the region that is the light switch that turns the gene on and off. So if you start mucking with this light switch with genetic variation, you can turn the gene off when it's supposed to be on. You'll basically break its regulation. Again, I'm, I'm oversimplifying here, but I want to get through some of this. So here's an example. This is a protein structure. This is one of these molecular machines. It's a ribbon representation. So it's, it's one of these necklaces. Again, it's self-organizing. It folds into a unique three-dimensional structure that you observe here. And there's a disease, tumoral calcinosis, that is associated with genetic variants that are in the FGF23 gene. And this is the FGF23 protein. Um, and there are a number of variants that are spread around across this. So one of the questions that geneticists love to ask is, well, I found this variant. It seems to be associated. I think it's a mutation. I think it's causing this disease. And so their question to me is, well, what does it do? What is it actually doing to this machine that makes it not work? It looks kind of, I mean, it's really a small part of the overall protein. So I think that this is, you know, really the challenge of what my, what our field is in terms of trying to understand the first principles of how genetic changes give rise to different diseases. Here's another example, collagen. Um, collagen is the, by far the most common protein in any of us, in mammals. Um, there are a number of different types of collagen, uh, uh, probably more than 30 now. I, I could be wrong about that. I'm not sure the exact number. Um, type 1 collagen is the most common. And if any of you have ever played with hemp rope, it's a lot like hemp rope. It, it's not like a, ne a necklace at all. If you take a, um, a long string of amino acids, like this necklace, this protein necklace we talked about, and take three of them, and then each one is then wrapped together in a helical shape. This is, just a, this is only 30 amino acids. So thir the real protein is 1,000 amino acids long. So it's quite long. And this protein forms a structural basis for you. It's the structure of your bones, tendons, ligaments, hollow organs. It's in your hair. It's basically what makes us structured. And it's like hemp rope. It's incredibly strong. And um, collagen forms collagen fibers, and, uh, fibrils and fibers, which then go in to make things like, ten like tendons and ligaments. It's also jello. We can take collagen and cook collagen. One of the reasons, one of the reasons cooking, like for example, slow cooking foods works the way it does is because it takes a long time at low temperature to break collagen down. So when you cook like say pulled pork, what you're doing is you're breaking the collagen down over a long period of time and that means the meat just falls apart because its structural rigidity is basically gone. Um, so Mutations occur in collagen. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, collagen has a regular structure. This necklace actually repeats. The th there are three amino acids that uh, repeat over and over and over again with some regularity. And every third amino acid is the amino acid glycine. And I'm not going to talk too much about biochemistry here, but the reason that glycine would, um, the reason that glycine is here in every third position, that's the green here, is that glycine is a really small amino acid. It doesn't have a large molecule that sticks out into the water, into the solution around this protein. And every third position, the protein change twists so that that part of the amino acid goes interstitial into this rope. It has points into the middle of this. And it can't fit there. So that's why evolution has given a glycine, 
this glycine amino acid in every position. Well, there are mutations that are in the population, they're rare in humans, that are in these glycine positions, and they give rise to a disease called osteogenesis imperfecta, or brittle bones disease. Um, there are four classes of what we call OI. Um, the first class is, uh, the first class is uh, uh, um, uh, relatively mild. There, I, I should say that they're relatively mild cases that are grouped into one class. Um, type 2 OI is prenatally lethal, so it's very serious. And one of the interesting questions that we work on in my group is trying to understand why one glycine mutation, say in this position here, gives rise to a mild form of OI, reproducibly, like multiple patients have this. And another one that maybe over here looks the same. I mean, it's all basically just a piece of rope, causes prenatal lethality. So I think this is another thing that's important to understand. And there are a lot of mechanisms that are proposed to do this. We run a database in my group called MuteDB. It's a web-based resource. You can go to MuteDB.org and visualize it. We're about to release a new version of it um, that's updated with, with uh, uh, essentially newer versions of the number of variants that we have. Um, and what we try to do is give insight into molecular mechanism. That is, um, we want researchers in osteogenesis imperfecta to look at collagen molecules and say, oh, this is why this variant is pre pre lethal, and this is why this variant is mild, and let's say we do a sequence of parents that have a history of OI, and they find a new variant that we've never seen before in collagen. Is that one going to be lethal or mild? And th this is really the ultimate goal. That's a long, I think that's somewhat of a long way away. We have some tools that can help with this, but not a lot. Um, and that's where, I'm, for the next probably 10 slides or so, uh, eight slides or so. I'm going to go pretty quickly because I've got some science here, but I, I think it might be a little bit, uh, a little bit, a little bit much. And I'd rather talk about some of the computer stuff here in a bit, um, uh, and some of the other things that we're working on. Um, but we can actually predict disease variants. So as I said before, we have 117,000 known sites across the human genome that are polymorphic that cause disease, genetic diseases, and we can imagine applying computer science, for example, machine learning. Let's say we took those 117,000 that cause disease, we take, say, 117,000 ones that we know don't cause disease, and we look for features, attributes, that can allow us to make an assignment of a new, vari a new variant that we've never seen before of whether it fits into the disease category or the non-disease category. There are a number of tools that have been built. MutePred is our tool. SIFT and Polyphen um, uh, are also used a lot. And they all work on the same principle that I just described. We have variants that don't cause disease. We have variants that cause disease. We have a variant that we can ask the question, does it look more like neutral or disease? Based on attributes that we can pull from the <coughs> genome. So we can use genomic features. We can use proteomic features. They just need to be easy to generate. Like, for example, um, uh, for example, how evolutionary conserved is that variant? Where we built those model, those large alignments for the genome with other species. We saw that some regions seem to be really conserved. Well, it turns out that when you have mutations in regions that are conserved in other species, that tends to cause human disease. This is a, um, a table. The details are not important at all. Every row in this Excel spreadsheet is a variant. Um, and all of the columns are methods that can predict whether a variant is going to cause disease or not. The white cells right here are um, the white cells are things that are predicted not to cause disease. The pink ones are things that are predicted to damage or cause disease. Um, and there is some concordance between the results, like this one right here. Everyone agrees that it's not going to cause disease. But, and then here, these ones, everybody agrees it's going to cause some functional effect. My favorite is, is this one right here. Every other method predicts something different. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done in this field. This is what we do. MuPred is our tool that does this. We use a bunch of different attributes. Um, we use the random forest classification technique and then make predictions about generate a score about whether we think a variant is going to cause disease. Um, I'm not going to talk about this at all. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this at all. We also predict for regulatory variants um, that give rise to difference in gene expression. We, in fact, can do this. Um, and we also do this with pharmacogenetic variants. All right, so I'm, I'm not going to talk about how we actually classify these. Um, so we're involved with something. So let, let's say someone did a genetic study. There's 117,000 of these variants that have been identified from genetic studies. Let's say that 
um, uh, we want to actually assess how predictive they are. We're going to sequence everybody in this room, and we're going to take one of those 117,000 variants. We're going to look to see if anybody in this room has that variant. And we have two copies, so we're going to see how many copies of this variant we have. Well, is that variant going to give rise to the phenotype that we see in this heterogeneous? Remember, the population that was used in terms of the genetic study is probably pretty limited. We don't know. We don't really know how predictive a lot of these variants are. We have some good ideas. Some have been reproduced in different populations, and a lot of rigorous work has been done. But for a large number of them, there hasn't been anything. So we've been involved with a project um, called the Critical Assessment of Genome <laughs> Interpretation, or KG. And we are the assess assessing group for the, PH, the PGP challenge, the Personal Genome Project Challenge. Um, and uh, essentially what's happening is that we have a number of genomes that are associated with real people who have real phenotypes, who have you know, real diseases and real um, uh, things that can be observed in a clinic. And we are per trying, asking groups to actually <laughs> apply their methods to predict what those phenotypes are what those people would look like clinically. And then I'm the assessing group, so they give us the data back, and then we assess basically what methods seem to work well and which ones don't, and how well we can actually predict this. The deadline for this year, we did it last year, the deadline for this year was um, on the 31st, or just a couple days ago, so we'll see how many solutions, how many submissions we actually get. This is in collaboration with Stephen Brenner at Berkeley, um, Susanna Repo, who's at Berkeley also and is head of KG, and um, George Church is the person behind the Personal Genome Project. Again, because I'm running out of time, I'm going to go pretty quickly through this. But as you know, there are personal genetics companies where you can spend 100 bucks or 400 bucks or something, and they will take a, a, a little bit of your tissue, you know, basically a little bit of your genetic information, and they will identify genetic variants across your genome and then associate them with specific diseases and phenotypes and then tell you what your, so, what your risks are for them. So that's essentially what we're trying to do in this, in this evaluation, is to see how well companies and individual labs can actually do. Um, the reason this is enabled is because the PGP uses what's called an open consent model. That is, the people give their genome for research and identify themselves. That's unlike almost all other types of medical research that you do traditionally, where you are completely de-identified. You're identified within the study, but you're de-identified in every other point. This, at this point, we'll actually publish who the person is. Their phenotypes, you know, what they have, you know, like what their cholesterol levels is not necessarily published. Some are. Um, and it's used for research. Um, it's mostly exome sequences. Exome is just sequencing the genes. It's not whole genome. It's just the genes. Um, and uh, it's, it's cheaper to do it that way. And predict, and the goal is to predict all of these different binary traits, like does this person have asthma or not? Um, what is their blood type? Some of these binary traits probably have a genetic component. Some of them have an environmental component. And some of them have, you know, both or neither, one or the other. Also was asked to predict numerical traits, like what's your birth weight? You could imagine that being entirely environmental. It doesn't ask what month you were born. But it might have some genetic component. Personalities, uh, things. And finally, um, it asks for your astrological sign, <laughs> which you would expect to not be that genetic, although there, there is some genetics there. Um, so we thought about ways that people would actually predict. Um, and the easiest way you could imagine was taking these databases that I discussed before and mapping them to these genomes and just calling it, saying, well, this database has a genetic variant associated with this, and that's what it is. <coughs> um, that's probably the simplest approach. We could also do what we call direct population, what I call direct population based approaches. That is, let's say I have a database of 100,000 people with genetic information and, like, say, their health record. Well, I'll just take the new people, the new people that we've never seen before, take their health record, take their genetic information, and say, what do they most look like? Sorry, just take their genetic information and then say, what do they most look like? And what is the health record of those people they most look like? Look like? And then make a you know association that way, basically clustering the genetics, and then doing a sign, you know prediction of what their phenotype is based on other people. You could do first principles too. Like so, say you have a gene um, uh, that causes a disease, 
and you have a genetic variant in that gene, and that genetic variant is predicted to break that gene, so therefore you think if you break that gene, you're probably going to cause that disease. And so that's using first principles. Um, you could find the data from other sources, or you could guess. That is, finding data from other sources, you actually could do your homework on these people. Um, so in, I'm not going to talk too much about the assessment. The first year we had one submission from an academic group. Um, I think I can say this was Rachel Karchin's group. She has a YouTube video about it. It's really interesting. I'm not going to talk about her method. Um, and the first thing that we did was there's actually a database called Snippedia, um, which is a Wikipedia-like for genetic variants. And actually, it's very popular. And they have a tool that they've built called Prometheus, which will actually predict your risk of certain diseases if you submit your genetic information. Um, and so we did this with these 10 people and then compared it to um, the predictions. And what we found was actually, um, this is hard to read, I'm sorry. So these point, you can see these points here. Was that there were, so this is, this is the group that submitted um, and this is the score from Prometheus. And what we found was that there was very low correlation, but occasionally we would get an outlier that both tools predicted to have high risk. So there's something, there's some variant here that both of these tools are picking up on that says this individual has a risk for Crohn's disease. Um, then other times there was no correlation like this. Um, but then for type 2 diabetes, here was another risk variant that was picked up. It must have been in some study. Again, coronary artery disease, no correlation. Um, this is difficult. What we want to do is get more submissions and more genomes. But we think it's uh, fascinating. I want to mention that, that um, the submitting group got uh, nearly all of the astrological signs correct. And she hasn't published yet how she did that. Um, so final thoughts. Um, we are very, you know, we're really at the cusp of being able to understand genetic information at a level we've never been able to do that before. I think at some point um, within most of our lives, I personally believe that we will probably have genome sequences for, for most of us. Um, it's going to get very, very inexpensive. And this three bit, you'll know, perhaps know your own three billion long base pair sequence. It is not fraught without challenges. We know genetic variants that give risk, very, very low levels of risk to certain phenotypes. Um, there is an ethical issue, there's a clinical issue, um, and there is a methodological issue in terms of treatment about how you deal with someone who has a 10% increased risk for some rare complex disease. That's the major challenge move, moving forward. Um, I'm, I'm out of time, so I'm not going to talk about the computer stuff we do, um, other than maybe just to give. We develop lots of web-based tools in my lab. We've developed more than 40 of them, web portals that are funded by NIH. Are there any computer programmers in this room that are interested in working for me? Send me an email. I'm always hiring. Um, I think that uh, uh, the computer systems that run biomedical research in the country are a lot like building a space shuttle. The problem is, we're, and we're investing billions of dollars into building this infrastructure, the problem is, is it's not contracts. We're not like NASA. We can't like describe a specific widget down to, you know, atomic level detail. What we can do is say, build a tool that kind of does this. And then at the end of the day, it's up to me to put them all together. It's hard, it's expensive, and it makes it very difficult. Um, but at the end of the day, we build tools that enable scientists to do their research. Um, so with that, I think I'll finish. Skip all of these extra computer slides and thank my group. Um, I will thank the IU School of Medicine people and the IU School of Informatics people I work with. Thank KG, Stanford, um, the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, Marcel Kahn, um, the HGMD group, David Cooper, and then all of the funding sources, and I would be happy to take questions. Thank you. Yes. So 
A genetic variant, let's just call it a SNP for the moment. Although there is a formal definition of SNP, so I'm being a little glib here. But a genetic variant that you observe in different individuals when you put all their genomes together, and you look at that column and that, that site on the genome, and it's different in different people. There's no disease, there's no clinical phenotype, there's no effect that's, a, that's annotated or associated or caused by that difference that you observe in those people, in those individuals. Okay? So there's no such thing as a perfect genome if you don't have those disease annotations. However, you could imagine taking a genome, like say the draft genome, and mapping the disease mutations, those 117,000 variants, back to that genome and saying, you know what, if we just like made a fake genome sequence that didn't have any of those variants in them, that might be the perfect genome. Um, and in fact, a tool abuse group at Stanford did that, published it in PSD last year, did an analysis and said, there's a lot of disease risk in the, the genome that we use as a control for our studies and identify them, where those, those risks work. Yeah, and you could, the paper's online, you can, you can read it. So that's the answer to your first question. The second question was errors. So sequencing approaches um, rely on, um, so I instruments that produce sequence are error prone. They make some level of mistakes. Um, the mistakes are relatively rare. Um, probably less than one out of 100 bases are wrong. Um, however, those mistakes are somewhat random it is somewhat random. Um, and when we do sequencing now, we make sure that we sequence in a single experiment multiple times at the same spot. This is called the depth of the experiment, the sequencing experiment. So if we have a great enough depth, that is we've repeated that sequence a number of times, we can see the random errors from the actual genetic variants and from the actual sequence. So we can correct those errors. Okay. Um, I don't know how to express it. Oh, you had a question? No, really. Right. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> well, I have a question. I don't know how, how to say it. Is it that well, aging is uh, really a very uh, uh, long-term type of thing? It's very, very difficult, certainly. But is it that Sorry, the, what? The aging. Yeah, the aging. aging. Uh, I mean, the, the research on aging is, yeah. is, is, is a long-term so right. because you really want to I mean, know how and the people go you know, beyond certain things. Right. Now, is it that uh, uh, you you go and then look for these variations, I mean, genomes and so forth, uh, that produce uh, uh, diseases, uh, I mean, they, uh, they, they, I mean the, the diseases which are killing, or they, how do you just go for the, for the aging? Because there are some people who, who can live like maybe over 100 years, nothing, basically nothing on them, yeah. except that, Basically, their tissues and so on, they, they just degenerate. Right. And then it's not, it's not like cancer or anything. Yeah. So how do you do that? So when we do a genetic, design a genetic study, yeah. we can study um, anything we want, yeah. whether it's genetic or not. Like, for example, I'm wearing a gray jacket, you're wearing a blue jacket. We could go around everybody on campus to see who was wearing gray and who's wearing blue. And we could genotype th those individuals identify their, you know, their genes, um, or genetic markers across their genome. And then we can do association. We can look and see, is there any genetic variants that seem to group with me and not group with your genome, or with the blue genomes? It's probably not genetic, right? Yeah. But we can do that. Um, we can ask any question we want. Um, and again, we probably wouldn't, if this is not genetic, we probably wouldn't get any variants that are statistically significant, assuming we do our statistics correctly. Um, okay, so aging and disease are just like the jackets. Right. We can ask very simple questions. If someone has a disease like, say, osteogenesis imperfecta, we can find everybody has osteogenesis imperfecta. We can find other people that don't. It depends on our study design. We can find, like, say, siblings and the families that don't in their families, but we could also do population based, where you take a bunch of people that have it and a bunch of people that don't have it, and just like the jackets, look for genetic elements that seem to be in one group and not the other. Aging is very similar. We are just starting to see the aging studies start coming out. So if we can describe easily an individual, like an aging phenomenon, 
the easiest one to think of is centenarian. People who live a long time versus people who don't. That would be a great way to study it. Just like Jack, just find that you're in group A, you're in group B, and we can do association. But do you identify any parameters, like you group up parameters, and you build on that? Because for example, people yeah. can, can, can live in different areas. Right, right. So that, now that's an environmental yeah. issue. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So ep epidemiology, ep epidemiology yeah. is very important in Asia as well. I'm just focusing on the genetics for the moment. Okay. Um, the, the genetic elements that vary across the genome um, in individuals, again, can be associated with anything. So as long as the clinician or the person who's doing the study has asked the right questions to everybody, you could imagine doing association with any of those questions that they answered, including definitions of what they're, you know, how they're aging. Um, and also risk for other diseases like cancer. So we could do a study that would look for the risk of cancer. People have done this, and we know genes that cause cancer. Um, and genes that have genetic elements that, that give rise to cancer. It's important to um, understand that we can do this, and in some specific cases, we have genetic elements that have been associated. What we don't have at this point is geno a genome-wide fingerprint, like I said. And again, it's just a matter of these studies actually getting 